The Unitarian Universalist Church of Ventura, California, presents a homily by our minister, the Rev. Dana Warsnop, titled Healing Stories for Thanksgiving, recorded on Sunday morning, November 22nd, 2020. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship with the Unitarian Universalist Church of Ventura. This congregation is committed to a search for truth and meaning, willing to be changed by what we learn on that search. This is why we call ours a living tradition. We invite all to come along on a journey of living, learning, growing. I am the Reverend Dana Worsnop, and it is my honor to serve this wonderful congregation. There are a whole host of folks who have collaborated to bring this service into being. Here is the list of our entire tech team, or the lineup rather, and today our director is Brian Fortune, our assistant director is Kitty Merrill, and our magician is Kent Brinkmeyer. Our tech support human is Joe Osborne. The people who are on screen will introduce themselves as we go along. <laughs> Just a couple of announcements. Uh, most of them, in fact, all of them about Thanksgiving. Uh, we are going to have our Ventura Interfaith Ministerial Association Interfaith Thanksgiving service. It will be on Zoom tomorrow night at 7 p.m. And you can find the link to that on our Facebook pages and in UUCV this week, probably on the website too. Uh, also, if you would like to have Thanksgiving dinner delivered to you, because this is just a weird Thanksgiving, uh, or if you are up for delivering Thanksgiving dinner to people, please do let us know there. Again, you will find the links uh, to a form letting us know all of that in many places in the church's communication. And lastly, I invite everyone to join me on Zoom for Thanksgiving. I'm going to be very safely here at home. And I suspect feeling just a little bit lonely, missing my family. So I want to just expand that and invite you all in. I will be holding an open Zoom room and come for hors d'oeuvres, for dinner, for dessert, for the whole shebang. I'll just be here and really happy to see you all. Three to five Thanksgiving day. And so as we begin this morning, in this 400th anniversary of the pilgrims' arrival in a land already inhabited by many people, let us acknowledge that the land we now live upon once belonged to whole tribes of other people, now mostly gone. For those living locally, it is the Chumash peoples and may we honor, take this day at this time to honor their history and their heritage and their gifts to us all. So let us take some moments to breathe together, turn our hearts toward one another and enter sacred space. Good morning to you. I am worship associate Jim Merrill. We hope that everyone here has a chalice or a candle to light and something to light it with. Let's light our chalices together. <clears throat> okay, totally faulty match.
We begin our service with these words by Pilgrim Edward Winslow, published in Mort's Relation in 1622. This is the only original description of what is commonly called the first Thanksgiving. He writes, our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on fowling so that we might after a special manner rejoice together after we had gathered the fruits of our labors. They four in one day killed as much fowl as with a little help beside served the company almost a week at which time, among other recreations, we exercised our arms, many of the Indians coming amongst us, and amongst the rest their greatest king, Massasoit, with some ninety men, whom for three days we entertained and feasted, and they went out and killed five deer, which they brought to the plantation, and bestowed on our governor, and upon the captain, and others. And although it be not always so plentiful as at this time with us, Yet, the goodness of God, we are so far from want that we often wish you partakers of our plenty. Come, let us worship together. Good morning. I'm Carolyn Bierke, music director, and I would like to invite you to join me in singing our first hymn, We Gather Together. service, we will be telling all sorts of stories about Thanksgiving that we hope can heal the, our Thanksgiving story. The first story of Thanksgiving that many of us learn is about the pilgrims and the friendly Indians and sitting down together for a great big Thanksgiving dinner. But that is not the whole of the story. And some of it, as you will learn, is just plain wrong. A big part of that story, though, is about Squanto, the very friendly Indian who saved the pilgrims' lives by showing them how to plant corn. I love this story. I love learning the deeper, the, the, the truer story behind this. Because some of what I just said actually happened though the truth is far more interesting and only the truth can help us truly heal Thanksgiving. So first off, his real name was Tisquantum, which probably wasn't even the name that his parents give him. And one of the reasons Tisquantum could help the pilgrims was that he already spoke English. And how on earth did he learn it? Well, six years, about six years before the pilgrims arrive, tis quantum, this may be an action, this is a, someone's drawing, I think, imagining what twist quantum would, would have looked like. And six years before the pilgrims arrived, tis quantum was kidnapped by English explorers. And first they took him to Spain and then he went to England and the whole time he was just trying to figure out how to escape because he was really in bondage. He was really essentially a slave had, so, and he wanted to escape and get back home. And when 
Finally, he sailed back across the sea. His homecoming turned out to be very sad. When he saw his home village again, every one of his people were gone. Almost all of them, including his family, had died of a terrible disease that earlier explorers had brought with them and that the Indians, the native peoples of that land had no natural immunity to. Historians think that this was when he took the name Tisquantum, which means li literally being really, really mad at God. You could say that Tisquantum means the wrath of God. And perhaps he was angry with God for killing his family. And yet also almost as bad as everyone being gone was that there were complete strangers living in the homes of in his town. Complete strangers. Yes, they were the pilgrims. For you see, the pilgrims sailed across the sea to start a new life. Though they hadn't planned it all very well, and they finally landed just a few weeks before winter started. And yet they could not believe the incredible luck because they, when they landed, they found this entirely empty village like it was just waiting for them. Without those buildings and some of the some leftover food, they wouldn't have lived through that first winter. The pilgrims thought that God had given them this place to live, just given it to them. And Tisquantum was mad at God. And the pilgrims thought that God was looking out for them. Interesting perspectives on the same event. The next spring, Tisquantum did come and teach the pilgrims to plant corn over fish buried in the ground so that the fish would feed the corn as it grew. And he wasn't doing it just to be friendly. With his village and all his people gone, Tisquantum had nowhere he really belonged. The nearest tribe, the Wampanoag, the Wampanoag didn't trust him because he'd been gone for so long and he wasn't a pilgrim. The only way he could survive was as a translator and go between, going back and forth between the pilgrims and the Wampanoag. And at the end of the pilgrims first summer and first harvest, they did have a big festival. And some of the Wampanoag did come by and eat too. With the help of Tisquantum, the pilgrims and the Wampanoag signed a treaty that lasted for more than 40 years. Yet, this tribe would still be nearly wiped out within 200 years. The way that this story has been handed down to us, that so the way so many of us learned about it in school, it sounds like a completely happy story about the pilgrims surviving under dire circumstances. And usually we skip over the sad parts. And yet a story that is all happy all, way, all the time, a story that is all happy always leaves something out. And a story cannot heal us if it leaves anything out, especially the parts that are sad for somebody in the story. And one of the things that I do love about being a Unitarian Universalist is that we are always growing and trying to find out new things Sometimes what we learn is really wonderful and exciting. 
And yet sometimes it, it, what we learn is sad and hard to hear. Yet the truth always give us, gives us ultimately a fuller and richer picture. And without knowing the whole truth, we can never make the hard and sad parts better. I like knowing that Tis Quantum was his real name. And even though he was very sad, even mad, he still played an important role in the world and in the history of this country. Each Sunday, this congregation gives away our collection to an organization in the larger community or to funds that help people in our own church. We now invite you to donate online. You'll see the link on the next slide, which will also be posted as in chat as a direct link. <clears throat> our offering today goes to Camp de Beneville Pines. Hi, my name is Brian Buck, and I'm a big fan of Camp de Beneville Pines. Nestled in the San Bernardino National Forest, above 6,000 feet north of Redlands, California, it is a three-hour drive from Ventura. My family has been going there ever since we discovered Unitarian Universalism. It's a beautiful place in the mountains. We've made many lifelong friends at camp, and our daughter Patty went to every kid camp we could send her to. Family camps and Thanksgiving camps were also on our schedule. And so over the years, under the guidance of camp director Janet James, the Beneville Pines has blossomed. There are an incredible number of camps offered year round. Numerous upgrades have been made to the cabins and Ome Lodge. The infrastructure, the water supply lines, the pathways and the road have all seen major improvements. Mm -hmm. During the last few years, the camp escaped being burned down in two massive forest fires. This past October, UU hikers visited the camp to fill sandbags to protect the property against erosion. The fires have disrupted the income that supports the camp that comes from those who go to enjoy living for a week in the mountains with other UUs. To understand Camp to Beneville Pines is to love the outdoors and nature. It is a place to be experienced, treasured, and safe for all generations. Please donate as you are able. Let our hearts not be hardened for those living on the margin. There is room at the table for everyone. This is where it all begins. This is how we gather in. There is room at the table for everyone. There is room for us all, and no gift is too small. There is room at the table for everyone. There's enough if we share. Come on, pull up a chair. There is room at the table for everyone. Long we have wandered, burdened and undone, but there's room at the table for everyone. Let us sing the new world in, this is how it all begins. There is room at the table for everyone. There is room for us all, and no gift is too small. There is room at the table for everyone. There's enough if we share. Come on, pull up a chair. There is room at the table for everyone. No matter who you are, no matter where you're from, there is room at the table for everyone. Here and now we can be the beloved community. There is room at the table for everyone. 
There is room for a song, and no gift is too small. There is room at the table for everyone. There's enough if we share. Come on, pull up a chair. There is room at the table for everyone. There is room for us all, and no gift is too small. There is room at the table for everyone. There's enough if we share. Come on, pull up a chair. There is room at the table for everyone. Oh my, that gave me chills and made me smile when I heard it the first time yesterday. Sue and Kent, you're amazing. Thank you, thank you. Hmm. And we are ever and always grateful for the generosity of this congregation. Your generous spirit is a bright thread woven through this tapestry of love we call community. Thank you. Each week, we lift up the joys and sorrows that have been shared with our community. You can submit your joy and or sorrow to be shared in one of two ways. Every Thursday, the email bulletin UUCV this week includes a link for sharing joys or sorrows. Or on our church website, you can use the drop down menu under Sunday services to find a link for joys or sorrows. <clears throat> when we are together in our physical sanctuary, we drop stones in water for each joy or sorrow. The ripples that go out remind us that we are all connected. Here in our virtual sanctuary that we make together today, we see the image of water and stones to help us keep that connection. I invite you now to speak aloud or in your heart the names of those you wish to celebrate or memorialize, or those who may need the loving embrace of this community. By invoking their names, even when we may not hear them, you bring them into this circle of caring that we call community. We hold these names, spoken and unspoken, in the silent sanctuary of our hearts. May we be truly grateful for all that is our life. We offer a reading in two voices this morning, Enough by the Reverend Vanessa Southern. So much undone, so much to do, so much to heal in us and the world, so much to acquire, a meal, a healthy body, a fit one, a lover, a job, a better one, proof that we have and are enough. Just around the corner now, and up against it, the reality of all that falls short and the limits of today. We honor the limits. If your body won't do what it used to do for right now, let it be enough. If your mind won't stop racing or can't think of the word, let it be enough. If you are here utterly alone and in despair, be all that here with us. If today you cannot sing because your throat hurts or you don't have the heart for music, be silent. When the offering plate goes around, if you don't have the money to give or the heart to give, let it pass. 
the world won't stop spinning on her axis, axis if you don't rise to all occasions today. Love won't cease to flow in your direction. Your heart won't stop beating. All hope won't be lost. You are a part of the plan for this world's salvation. Of that I have no doubt. The world needs its oceans of people striving to be good, to carry us to the shores of hope and wash fear from the beachheads and cleanse all wounds so they can heal. But oceans are big, and I am sure there are parts that don't feel up to the task of the whole some days. Rest, if you must. Then, like the swimmer lying on her back who floats, or the hawk carried on cushions of air, rest in pews made to hold weary lives in space carved out for the doing of nothing much but being. Perhaps then you will feel in your bones, in your own weary heart, the aching, healing sense that this is enough, even this. That we are enough. You are enough. Enough. I invite you now into a time of quiet <clears throat> meditation. Take a moment to rest. Take note of your breathing. Take a deeper breath. Let whatever arises be there. Whatever is true, whatever is enough. A silent meditation.
What a joy to be back with my choir friends. <clears throat> and now I offer this Thanksgiving reflection. In our story for the child of each of us, we heard of Tisquantum, Squanto of pilgrim lore. In our call to worship, I read Edward Winslow's words, the only original source that describes the Plymouth Colony's 1621 Harvest Feast, a story which the centuries have embellished. Full disclosure, I have five ancestors from three different families who were present at that 1621 party. Two of my ancestors, though, were among the 50 of 102 Mayflower passengers who did not survive the voyage and the winter of 1621. <clears throat> when, as we heard, with the support and instruction of their Wampanoag allies, the surviving English brought in their first harvest in 1621, they were glad to be alive glad of the bounty, and ready to celebrate. They were not, however, celebrating Thanksgiving. For this religious community, a Thanksgiving day would have been for worship, prayer, and fasting. Now, these days of feasting were just a good old fashioned celebration. In preparation, they hunted birds, certainly including turkey, no matter what the skeptics tell us. And they played games. Winslow tells us they exercised their arms, meaning that they probably had shooting competitions. Modern scholarship suggests that it was the sound of gunfire coming from Plymouth that drew the Wampanoag's attention. They were likely not invited but arrived curious to learn what was happening in the village of their allies. <clears throat> Once they had crashed the party, they realized that some venison would be an appropriate host's gift, and they brought five deer bestowed diplomatically upon the governor, William Bradford, the plantation's military leader, Miles Standish, and others. It was the diplomatic relationship established by the Wampanoag Sachem Massasoit and Governor Bradford that maintained a tenuous peace and mutual benefit between the two peoples for over four decades after the arrival of the Mayflower. This diplomacy was made possible in part by Tisquantum, who served as a go-between and who also knew how to play both sides to his own benefit. It was this detente that made it possible for Massasoit and his possibly 90 men to wander into Plymouth uncontested. How then did US culture get from one paragraph about a feast to the fabricated pageant lore of Thanksgiving, which so many of us have grown up with? To begin with, Winslow's one paragraph account of that feast was lost to America for over two centuries. Nobody was referring to it. People throughout New England and the rest of European settled North America held their own harvest feasts, but not because of any awareness of the party in 1621. <clears throat> in 1841, over two centuries later, Alexander Young, a Boston Unitarian minister, published a compilation of forgotten works by the early pilgrims. In a footnote, a footnote to Edward Winslow's 1621 harvest description, Young wrote, this was the first Thanksgiving, the harvest festival of New England. No one had ever made that claim before because that original description was not on anybody's minds. Sarah Josepha Hale, publishing pioneer among women and friend of Unitarians, had a long campaign to establish a national day of Thanksgiving, no doubt inspired and embellished by the Reverend Young's discovery and comment. She finally convinced President Lincoln to declare a national day of Thanksgiving. <clears throat> we in America have rarely been taught that the event that we mythologize as the first Thanksgiving was not what the pilgrims would have considered a day of thanksgiving, 
nor are we taught about the tenuous peace that existed between the Plymouth and the Wampanoag. Lately, because the Pilgrim's story was co-opted by 19th century fictionalists, those original Mayflower passengers are now the lightning rods, the scapegoats, the others at whom some can point a finger and say, there, there, there is the root story of our colonialism and of the tragic decimation of the indigenous peoples in the Northeast and throughout the land, even though we are pointing our fingers at a myth. I find myself wondering whether it is easier to look back at a two-dimensional representation of the complex issues of colonization than it is to consider the long shadow of colonization's consequences and the network of indigenous and European interactions. And if we look back intentionally, how will that inform how we look forward toward the injustices that remain inherent in our culture? Now. Thank you, Jim, for sharing part of the story of your family. That embellished myth of Thanksgiving that Jim did just unpack for us is woven deeply into the American psyche from wherever each of us stands. Most, uh, most all of us have connections to it in some way or another. Anyone who has ever been in a school play as a pilgrim or an Indian or maybe even a turkey anyone, and also those with ancestral connections, like Jim's heritage. Who else among us can, can trace your heritage back to the Mayflower or the Ma Native American tribes of the Wampanoag and Patuxet, or maybe even both? Then there are people like me who grew up in a town called Plymouth, in Massachusetts or Wisconsin or California, or in my case, Michigan, where we took our pilgrim heritage seriously. We even had our own Plymouth Rock in the center of town. Yes, ours is the one on the right. The one on the left is the so-called Plymouth Rock in Plymouth, Massachusetts. The teams at my high school were called the Rocks. Yes, the Plymouth Rocks. And so our pom-pom squad was called, you guessed it, the Rockettes. My best friend in high school was a cheerleader for the swim team. And yes, the other teams always chanted at the swim meets, sink rocks, sink. Somehow rocks was perhaps a good name for a football team, but not so much for a swim team. Or maybe even for the track team that I was on. As compelling and as deeply ingrained as the myth of the first Thanksgiving is in American culture, it is vital for us to learn to tell the whole of this history. Perhaps it is more accurate to call them our histories because thinking that history is one tale told from one perspective usually the victors, the people who won, get to tell the story. But one telling one tale from one perspective is actually part of the problem. The wholeness of history is almost always more interesting, even if it is also heartbreaking. Knowing the whole history our understanding of ourselves and this land we live in becomes richer and fuller and even more compelling. And in that truth lies the possibility 
of healing. Even as the myth of the first Thanksgiving has Unitarian connections, it is also a key tenet of our faith that the truth is ever unfolding, that we evolve and are willing to be changed as we uncover deeper truths. As our hit closing hymn, today we'll speak to there is a truth or perhaps a relationship to truth that sounds along the ages and so and as so it calls it calls and lo new justice it speaks and lo new truth there are so many ironies in this truer and fuller story one lies in our own our own as religious people our own pilgrim heritage for yes the congregation that was first founded in plymouth massachusetts is now a uu church and those pilgrims did believe that god hath more truth and light yet to break forth into the world in other words, revelation is not sealed. It is new in each person, in each new age, in each moment. And our commitment to that truth has helped us grow and deepen into the evolving faith that we practice today. And even even as new truth comes along and breaks open dearly held mythology like that of the first Thanksgiving, which did not look like this at all, this image of Thanksgiving, charming as it appears, has been used to justify any number of atrocities in the name of American exceptionalism. The narrative of America as the very best country ever, ever, ever in the history of all humankind, a model for everyone else to follow, a people who are always the good guys, who always mean well in the world a country that has no shadow side at all. Yet denying the shadow, as Jim points out, usually means that we have projected it elsewhere onto other whole groups of people who we then label as bad people. And that is never good. And that is one of the problems we have with this half story, half myth. A commitment to the facts that lie behind the mythology keeps it real. It keeps us humble. And it is ultimately a hopeful path, or at least it points us down a hopeful path. For we can use it to help heal the damage that was caused by the myth. So today, we tell a fuller story, even as it breaks our hearts. The story of Tisquantum is heartbreaking. Kidnapped and enslaved, then losing all his home and all his people, finding the only way to survive is through the people who now occupy his ancestral home, a people he greets with a new name, essentially saying to them, hello, I am the wrath of God, and I am here to help. Yet my heart also breaks at the pilgrims who find this empty village and take it as a sign of God shedding his grace upon them, blessing their dangerous endeavor. 
and the ironies just keep on coming. The irony that Lincoln made Thanksgiving a national holiday to help unify a divided people during a bloody civil war using a story embellished and mythologized practically beyond recognition, a myth with so many unforeseen consequences, including that the pilgrims are used in a story of American exceptionalism that they did not espouse at all. The irony that Thanksgiving has become a holiday beloved by so many disparate people. The irony that now on the 400th anniversary of the Pilgrim's Landing, we celebrate this holiday once more in, a, in divided and disjointed times. Times so fraught that it is making our own celebrations evolve. Who ever thought that Thanksgiving could look like this? As Jim said, it was a custom to hold days of Thanksgiving in pilgrim time and beyond. A good custom because giving thanks is important even if that's not exactly what the pilgrims were doing in 1621. And so let us give thanks for all the gifts of our American ideals and for knowing the more complete story, for an involving faith that keeps us humble and reminds us to give thanks let us give thanks. Let us be grateful. Not for the harms that this myth has wrought, but for the possibility of a call to new justice and new truth. It is good that we can come to hold our ideals even more closely as we become clearer about our failings as individuals and as a nation. For without that knowledge, I fear we can never heal or make progress toward the deeper unity we so desperately need. Yet, let us also give thanks for enough. Yes, for having enough, if we do, and also for being enough, doing enough. As the poet tells us, the world needs its oceans of people striving to be good. Yet oceans are big. And when you don't feel up to the task of the whole, then you also get to rest, knowing that this is enough. Even this. Let us give thanks for the abundance we have. Let us give thanks for the unfolding search for truth. Let us give thanks for our capacity to learn and grow and change our understanding of ourselves, our understanding of our nation, our understanding of how we make it better. Let us give thanks for the possibility of true healing and may it all be enough. Amen. And may it be so. I invite you now into a time of prayer. Holy beingness, 
Holy beingness of many names and no name, mystery beyond all naming, spirit of life and truth, which dwells within and among and beyond us this day and always. May we, each of us, find ways to be agents of healing. May we speak clearly what we know to be true. May we seek ever justice and may we seek ever deeper meaning. And when we uncover new truth and new justice, may we speak it clearly and fiercely. May we be agents of healing. May we start with gratitude and grow into hope. May we tell the story of each of our true lives and the narrative, the true narrative of all humans in all times with hard truths and glorious truths with gratitude. And may all those who are ill find healing. May those who are in despair find hope. May those who are without shelter find home. And may all those suffering in conflict and war throughout the world, may they and we know peace. Amen and blessed be. Please join me in our closing hymn, It Sounds Along the Ages. Extinguishing your chalice at home. We extinguish the chalice, but not the light in our hearts, the warmth of community, or the assurance and goodness we have found here. Those we carry into our lives until we gather again. <clears throat> 
In a moment, you will all be placed in breakout rooms for a virtual coffee hour. And even if you are new among us, I sincerely invite you to join in. And then following the benediction, you will be put into breakout rooms and uh, you can join your group or opt out at that point. And if you want to keep on chatting after your room is done, you can return to the main room and then be put in a brand new breakout room. And so I leave you with these words adapted from the Reverend Vanessa Southern. You are a part, you are part of the plan for this world's salvation. Have no doubt. The world needs its oceans of people striving to be good, to carry us to the shore of hope and cleanse the wounds that, so that they can heal. And yet when the task is daunting, remember that we are enough, that you are enough. And so go forth and strive to be good. Tell the truth as fully as you can, even, as, even when it hurts, so that you may also go forth in love, go forth in good health, go forth in peace. May it be so. We hope you've enjoyed Healing Stories for Thanksgiving, presented by the Reverend Dana Warsnop, recorded on November 22, 2020, for the Unitarian Universalist Church of Ventura, California.